This topic today is, is what time is it? It's, it's something I've been asking the Lord a lot lately, in the last probably month or so. Uh, you know, going back to what Jerry was sharing with Habakkuk, you know, first the prophet's complaining about the society, the culture, what's happened, and why aren't you doing something about it? And then he says, I am going to do something about it, and I'm bringing the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, and they're going to come in, and they're going to wipe you out. And then he goes, what? How can you use them, an evil nation, to come in and punish us? And so he, he, he's pondering back and forth, you know, how can this happen? And I think we find ourselves in such a, a different situation. I gave a message of the same title on 11 11 18. And when I gave that message, I was talking about what time is it, and especially I was talking about what time is it for us as individuals and what time is it with us for as a church body. And that was when I gave that message, uh, that was when. Uh, Pastor Mark Jackson made his decision uh, after that message that it was his time, that his time was, was over, and we began to make a, a transition from, again, a, a paid pastor situation to a, a volunteer. Um, we began to go after a five-fold ministry, uh, a body ministry, and make a change to what we felt like was more of a uh, New Testament type uh, example of, of what church life is supposed to be. But now I'm, I'm asking uh, that question in a, in a little different way because it's, it's mainly concerning us as a nation. I think I've talked about before, and I know Scott's talked about, you know, there's two different Greek words for, uh, for time, and one is chronos, which is basically just the, the chronological time as it goes by. An Icarus moment, which means uh, it's the right or the critical, the opportune moment, the sovereign time that when God says, now is the time, I'm moving, I'm doing something. And I feel like we're, as a nation, we're coming in, into that time. You know, uh, I just read a report from Barna has done a survey of churches, and they say that one out of every five churches will close in the next 18 months. That's one thing I'm, I'm very grateful and thankful to the Lord that he has prepared us ahead of time, made these changes back in... Back in 18, I had a uh, interesting, uh, my son, uh, one of my sons who, who goes to a, a church, um, it's a mega church in uh, Dallas it's called Watermark. <clears throat> Their pastor recently uh, is, is stepping aside. And you know what usually happens sometimes with is, is there, there's sin involved or there's uh, financial or sexual things going on. Uh, but in this case, it, it was not that at all. He said he's, he's, he's stepping down because of pride. That the Lord had convicted him of pride. And I remember Bob Jones always used to say, you know, the three G's, girls, glory, and gold would be the things that bring so many pastors, ministers down. And I think that's for the same truth for all of us. But as I was asking the Lord, what time is it for our nation? I have a, 
a, um, what I'm going to give you is, is three different scenarios of, of what the possibility is. If we were to look four months into the future, we're in the middle of September now, let's say it's the middle of January. So about four months. And one would be that life kind of gets back to normal. You know, the election is over, the election settled, there's not riots, there's election went well, uh, the economy is, is starting to come back slowly, uh, maybe have a vaccine in place and the COVID becomes kind of not of an issue, and we're talking more about things, maybe about the Super Bowl, and we're, you know, back to almost 2019 again. I, I hope that is true, just because I like my comfort and I like my ease. I actually don't believe that's going to happen, but I can hope and I can pray. I want to look you look at, if you open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20, and I want to give you a couple of scriptures on each of these different scenarios as we go through them. But 2 Kings chapter 20, it's, it's a story of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was actually one of the good kings of Judah. He did a lot in restoring things and restoring the temple and, and bringing back proper worship. And in chapter 20, uh, and just to go back a little bit, I'm actually going to probably want to actually start what I want to talk about is 14, but let's go back to the first. It says that, that in, in these days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. Now the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you are going to die, you will not recover. Now, there's a great prophetic word for you. <clears throat> How many of you want to receive that one, huh? And, and basically what happens is that Hezekiah turns his face to the wall. He cries out, and he reminds the Lord of everything he's done. I've restored the temple. I've, I've, I've got our worship back correctly. I've done all the things I've done for you. And it says that... Uh, that before Isaiah got out of the, uh, the palace complex, I, uh, the Lord told him, go back and tell Hezekiah uh, that I'm going to heal him. And I will add 15 years to his life. And I always think of that and think, you know, he added 15 years to life. That was a huge deal for, for Hezekiah, wasn't it? But you know, Hezekiah's been dead a long time. So as you put things into perspective of eternity. And then he goes on and uh, he says, what will be the sign in verse 8? The Lord will heal me and then I will go to the temple of the Lord on the third day. And Isaiah answered, this is what the Lord says to you, that the Lord will do what he promised. Shall this shadow go forward ten steps or shall it go back ten steps? Well, it's a simple matter for the shadow to go down ten steps said Hezekiah, I'd rather have it go back 10 steps. So if we're talking about chronos, chronological time, the Lord changed time. It moved back 10 steps. Actually changed the timing of the world, if you ever think about that. But that's not what I'm really here to want to talk about in this, with Hezekiah. I want to ask to go to verse 14. Because what happened later, <clears throat> the Babylonians had sent some representatives to him. And so we pick up the, the story in verse 14. It says, Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did these men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came from Babylon. The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing 
among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Hezekiah said, or then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood that will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Isaiah tells him what's going to happen. Going to, Babylonians are going to come. They're going to take everything, all the treasures, all the people, and that even his children, grandchildren, will be taken captive. They will be castrated and made eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. But what is Hezekiah's response in verse 19? The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? Where was the concern for the children and the grandchildren? If scenario number one comes about, where is our concern for what is eventually coming? that will affect maybe our children and our grandchildren. We don't want to be, Hezekiah was a, a great king, but we don't want that response. Scenario number two. History teaches us that God raises up a nation and he brings down a nation. If you think through biblical history, you know, as say from the time of Israel, the Assyrian Empire was a superpower of the day. They're the ones who destroyed uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And they were the superpower. But then after time, the Lord, as he brings up a nation, he brings another one down, he brought up the Babylonians. The Babylonians came in, took over Assyria, defeated Assyria, and they became the superpower of the day. Nebuchadnezzar reigned over all the known world of the time. It says in Daniel that even the animals were subjected to Nebuchadnezzar, who was a, he was a heathen. I mean, he was not, he was a pagan. And then after the Babylonians came the Medes and Persians, and they defeated the nation of, of Babylon, and they reigned for a while, and then the Lord brings Alexander the Great, who conquers the Medes and the Persians and conquered the known world. And, and actually, it's a fascinating story. If you think he, he either died at when he was not, uh, 30 or 33, he conquered the entire world. Europe, all the way across the Middle East, into India at that young age. It, it's, it's unbelievable, really, what he was able to accomplish. And so his empire and the uh, spread, and they reigned, and after his death, there are four kings that divided up the kingdom. But anyway, they were replaced by the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire then takes, and they last a long time, but eventually, as we all know, the Roman Empire falls. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Gonna look at a few verses in Isaiah. And in Isaiah 40, verses 15, it says, Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. So the nations are like a drop in the bucket. Drop down to verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understand that since the earth was founded, he sets enthroned above the circle of the earth, 
and the people are like grasshopper. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and he spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. If you turn over the next prophet, Jeremiah, chapter 18. And we're going to start with verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disasters I had planned. And if another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and it does evil in the sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I had intended for it. So as our nation has turned its back on the Lord, going back to the 60s when we took the Lord out of schools, we took prayer out to the place where we have aborted millions of babies in the womb, we have legislated, codified gay marriage in this nation. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5. I don't think we're going to read this whole, because actually it would be the whole chapter, so I'm just going to kind of tell you part of it. <clears throat> but what happens in Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar, who's one of the descendants of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's giving a feast for his, uh, all his leaders, rulers, army leaders, their wives, and they're drinking out of the, the cups and the elements that had been taken from, Bab- from uh, Jerusalem 70 years or more before. And it says, and this is where we get the, you know, the famous uh, saying that, can you read the handwriting on the wall? Because a hand appears... And it begins to write on the wall. And King, it says in, in fact, verse 5, says, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. near the lampstand in the royal palace. And the king watched as it wrote, and his face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. And so he he asked all his Chaldeans and the uh, astrologers to interpret for him what 
it says. Yeah, they cannot, and someone tells him to call Daniel. Daniel's an old man by this time, has uh, been through generations uh, serving kings from Cyrus on through. And Daniel comes, and, and basically he interprets it, and you'll find that in verse 26. So these are the words, what the words mean. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales. And found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar commanded Daniel to be clothed in purple and gold, and a chain was placed on his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So what happened was that, you know, Babylon was one of the, the seven wonders of the world. Its walls, on top of the walls, you could, you could have three or four different uh, chariots could be side by side. It was such a huge fortified city. And that's why they were not worried about the Medes and Persians being outside because no one could, could penetrate those walls. But what happened was the Persians and, the Persians and Medes is that at night they, the, the Euphrates, Euphrates River ran through, ran through the city. And they diverted the Euphrates River and that way, it dried up the river bank or the river bed, and they walked underneath the wall into the city and took it. And then that very night, he died, and the kingdom of Babylon was history. Now you know, for us as a superpower, our military is is also the greatest superpower, right? But. If our economy goes, so goes the military. And what I'm talking about is, is the Lord raising up a nation, putting down a nation. Now, in this second scenario I'm talking about, it may not be the end times. That might be 50 years from now. I don't know. But we, as a nation, are no longer a superpower. Now, the third scenario is much like the second, but it's not just the U.S. Uh, that, is, that is touched by this. It, it's the whole world. Economically, whether that's uh, economic depression or whether it takes the form of hyperinflation, which will bring war between nations, probably limited nuclear exchanges, And those things, you know, as you look through the Bible, you, you see a pattern. It says war, or they, in the Bible, they usually use the word sword, which means war. War, the sword, which creates famine, which creates pestilence. And they all kind of come in a pattern. And as this begins to sweep the world, people are going to cry out for peace and safety. They will be willing to give up their sovereignty. They'll be willing to give up their freedom. And this prepares the way for a man of, known as the man of lawlessness, man of Antichrist. If you turn to Second Peter chapter 3. It 
2 Peter chapter 3, we're just going to look at verses 3 through 7. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago God's word, the heavens, existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. But these waters also, the world, at that time was destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. So sometimes we do often heal, as I think even Lonnie mentioned this morning about, you know, well, every generation has believed that uh, they were the last generation. Well, that, that's really not true. There have always been groups of people, you know, somewhere on a mountain believing that the Lord was returning. But no time in the history prior to this generation has the majority of Christians believed that they could be living in the, in the last generation. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 13. There's a couple different times, just in actually in, in, in chapter 13 and, and 14, where the same statement is given. But if you go back in, in chapter 13, as he's talking about the beast, John the Revelator, and he says in verse 7, he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, every people, every language, and nation. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all those whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go to captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. But here's the key. It says, this calls for patience, endurance, and faithfulness on the part of the saints. He's letting us know ahead of time. This calls for patient endurance, and faithfulness on the part of of the saints. But if you don't know the Word of God, when these things begin to happen and the Antichrist is ruling and he is conquering and makes war against the saints and he conquers them, your faith could be shaken if you don't know the Word of God. And so it calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of of the saints. And he actually gives the same thing in verse 12, 14. He says, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God, who obey God's commandment and remain faithful to Jesus. Interesting. I didn't think we were going to be here, right? <clears throat> yeah. All right. So, with all those three different scenarios, and as I kind of said earlier, I don't think scenario, scenario one, although I would like that, is going to happen. What is our response to be? So I want to go to Matthew chapter 25. And it's a parable of the ten virgins. 
So Matthew chapter 25. Starting verse 1. Again, this is Jesus speaking. It says, At this time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now the foolish ones took the lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and then fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here comes the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, because they all got Sleepy. They all got drowsy, didn't they? They woke up and they trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the others came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So the five foolish virgins weren't willing to pay the cost to go and already buy the oil. They were not prepared. Now the oil speaks many times a symbolism of the Holy Spirit. So it's important for all of us to get the Holy Spirit, to, to do whatever it takes to pay the cost, whether it's time, energy, finances, to get more of the Holy Spirit so that our lamps are full when that day comes. And if you remember, back when I did the, the message on the rapture, I said, to meet the bridegroom in this passage is the Greek word epantheos. Now, it's only used in two other places in the New Testament. So it's used here. As you can see, the virgins are going out to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom doesn't turn back and go back. The people who are coming out to meet him turn with him and they're walking in that same direction. So the principal person is the direction that it's always going. Now, the two other places that's used is in Acts chapter 28. You don't need to turn there. But that's where, where Paul is coming into uh, Rome as a prisoner. He's brought from Caesarea all the way in after the shipwrecks and all the things he went through. And it says that Christians from Rome went out to meet Paul. So when they go out to meet him, Paul is the principal character. He's coming. They turn around when they meet him, and they come with Paul going that same direction. They don't go the opposite direction. The other one is 1 Thessalonians chapter 14, verse 13 through 17, which says, The live Christians are caught up into the air to meet the Lord. So the Lord doesn't come and then turn around and go back to heaven. He's coming this direction. We come to meet him. We turn around, and we're coming. So just always keep that in mind. That word meet is critically important. One last scripture, Second Chronicles chapter 7.
This is a very well-known passage. In verse 14, so what's our response? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. He says, it's my people who are called by my name. It's not the people of the world that are going to repent and suddenly turn. It's upon the church, it's upon God's people, that we are to humble ourselves and to pray and to seek his face. So I, I feel like our nation is literally hanging in the balance you know, we, we all have a, a kind of normal bias in that we think that tomorrow, that next year is going to be like this year. But there's a generation that are going to experience all the things that we read about in Revelations, Thessalonians, through Matthew 24. And I feel like we're coming to a time where it is, again, just critical that we truly repent, that we truly cry out to the Lord. And so what I'm what asking you to do is to, for the rest of this month, take 20 minutes, sometime during your day, I'm not going to try to organize and have people come here, dedicate yourself to 20 minutes of, of interceding. We're coming up on the Jewish holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is September 18th through 20th, and Yom Kippur is the 27th and 28th. And it's just a critical time that as we intercede for our nation. And 20 minutes is something I think we can all do. And what I would ask you to do is that you would you pray for the nation. You would pray for... Uh, for this upcoming election, for one thing. You would pray for revival for the church and for a third great awakening to come to this nation. Pray that our lamps would be full of oil. Pray that each of us would have patient endurance and faithfulness even unto death. For our own body, we must pray that we are, would stand as one, that we would stand in complete unity with each other. The enemy wants to bring in division and strife, but we must stand strong. But I believe that's what, is, what the Lord is saying. That's a, it's a sober, it's a serious time. And it's so easy for us to get to just try to get back to, to normal life and be distracted with things, the busyness of life, and, and not realize that our nation is truly in the balance. And I don't know which way it is. I don't know for sure. Maybe it will come back and think God will bless us and leave behind a blessing. You know, there's in Scripture and differently the prophet says, perhaps the Lord will leave behind a blessing. And we pray for that and we ask for that. And if he does, we don't want to be like Hezekiah was, right? <clears throat> we want to care. We want to pray for our, our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren. But if it's a time where the, the Lord is, is taking down a nation, then we have to be all right with that and be able to be, able to be light in a time of darkness. And if it's a third type, third scenario where we are actually entering into, in the next decade of days of end times, of things playing out, then our lamps, we want to have oil in our lamps, we want to have our lights to shine brightly. Because when deep darkness, as it says, what, in Isaiah 60, 
Arise and shine and let your light shine. So it's a critical time. It's a critical day, a critical hour. And again, I'm not, my purpose is not to bring fear, but it is to bring a sober reality of the days we are living in. And that we be prepared to be those lights and to have the oil we need. So I would really encourage you just to, to set aside 20 minutes for the rest of this month to pray, to intercede for this nation. And I just thought it was so apropos that, that the Lord would give Jerry that word this morning. You know, it's just like confirmation. It's a sober hour. So I want to pray, Lord, we do intercede for our nation. Lord, I first ask for this upcoming election for favor. Lord, that righteousness would prevail. Lord, I pray for peace. Lord, in our nation. I pray for righteous government, righteous judges. Lord, you says when, when righteousness, a, a nation is blessed when the righteous prevail. So, Lord, we, we long for that, Lord. We, we cry out for that. We say, yes, Lord. And, Lord, we pray for revival. We pray for revival for our own church body, but we pray for revival for the churches across this nation that you would pour out your spirit. Lord, we are so needy. Lord, when you walk in the room, everything changes. And we're longing for those. We're longing for your presence. We're longing for your power to be revealed. Lord, do a work in our day, in our time. And Lord, we pray for a third great awakening for this nation. Lord, you've done it twice on our behalf, Lord. In our past, of our past history, you have turned the nation back. So, Lord, we cry out for that, for a great awakening, for a mighty harvest of souls. But, Lord, if you are bringing a nation down, help us to stand strong, not to fear, but to be of great courage. And to be light in a time of darkness. And Lord, if it is that time of, of even the time of, of unfolding, of end time events, of the, the coming of the lawless one, of the one world government, Lord. You knew we'd be alive at this time. And while we may not feel we have the courage or the confidence, you knew we would be here and you will give us what we need. So, Lord, I ask that we would be like the wise virgins, Lord, that our, that our lamps are full of oil, that we would shine brightly in a time of increasing darkness. Lord, we love you. We love you, Lord. And we desire the fullness of your kingdom. And, Lord, we desire not our will, but your will be done. So whatever the future holds, Lord, we throw our, our lives in your hands. We trust you. We say, come, Lord. Come, Lord, and do a work. In our lives, Lord, prepare us. Make us steady. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.